Hey everybody, and thanks for coming in to today's webinar. Let me turn down my other mic. Catheter technology, evidence-based risk reduction brought to us by Teleplex Medical. And um, I will be introducing our speaker today. We've got Jim Lacey. You can see his picture up top. Well, welcome to the webinar this afternoon, Catheter Technology, Evidence-Based Risk Reduction Strategies. We're going to be reviewing um, a number of things today. Uh, pretty much uh, healthcare organizations have really focused on infection prevention teams to reduce hospital acquired condition rates, um, particularly those with vascular access catheters. That coupled with the types of complex patients we have today, inconsistent vascular access delivery models from sometimes floor to floor, hospital to hospital, or department to department. And with the introduction of newer guidelines and new technologies, um, we see changes in vascular access. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just review the occurrence and risk reduction opportunities for catheter-related complications, particularly focusing on uh, catheter-related bloodstream infection and catheter-related venous thrombosis. Uh, my little bit of uh, disclosures here. Uh, I am a consultant for Teleflex Medical, Adhesion Biomedical. Uh, I was on the Speakers Bureau of Genentech until last year, and I am a member of the Board Development Committee for AVA. So your learning objectives are here on the screen. Um, and throughout the session, um, we're going to just be talking about these different subjects uh, as we go along, focusing again on thrombotic complications, uh, considerations for catheter technologies, evidence for protected catheter technologies, and we'll talk a little bit about the bundles associated with risk reduction. So let's talk first, or let's look at first vascular access device related bloodstream infections. So I'm um, going back because sometimes we uh, have to just kind of review some basic terminology depending on uh, who's on the webinar or who's in, in a course. So if there's BSI on the screen in any of the slides, that means bloodstream infection. There are two types of bloodstream infection. It can be primary or secondary. A primary, uh, primary bloodstream infection is one that is caused by a device or a specific place or part in the body, okay? And so a secondary is when the infection actually comes from a different place in the body. So it becomes a secondary infection. Example urinary tract infection, and they end up with a catheter-related bloodstream infection, in quotes, because they do have a catheter-related infection, but the organism is the same as from the urine, so it's considered a secondary bloodstream infection. We also know today that we focus on CLABC, or central line associated bloodstream infection, and catheter-related bloodstream infection. Um, though we know that infections caused by other vascular access devices, as well as secondary bloodstream infections, have been shown to have the same potential morbidity and mortality and treatment costs as CLABC. And a lot of times, because we're so focused, on CLABSI in the hospital, we forget that other types of bloodstream infections and secondary infections do have the same potential morbidity and mortality. According to the CDC surveillance definition, a central line is an intravascular catheter that terminates at or close to the heart or in one of the great vessels and is used for infusion, withdrawal of blood, or hemodynamic monitoring. A CLABSI is any laboratory confirmed bloodstream infection where an eligible bloodstream infection organism is identified and an eligible central line is present 
on the laboratory confirmed bloodstream infection date of event. Now, doesn't that sound a little convoluted? So pretty much to tell you kind of interpret that, an eligible central line will have been in place for more than two consecutive calendar days. And we count those as central line days. So two consecutive calendar days would be on or after central line day three. Following the first access of the central line, so the first time it is actually accessed for use in an inpatient location and during the current admission. Those lines are eligible and remain eligible to be called a CLABSI event if infection occurs until the day after removal from the body or the time of patient discharge, whichever comes first. Catheter-related bloodstream infection, or CRBSI, is a rigorous clinical definition defined by precise laboratory findings that identify the central venous access device as the source of the bloodstream infection. It's used to determine diagnosis, treatment, and possibly epidemiology of the bloodstream infection. It's not typically used for surveillance, where CLABC is truly a surveillance definition and is a reportable event uh, to NHSN or the National Healthcare uh, Network. So let's just review a little bit more on bloodstream infections. Let's talk about CLABSI versus non clapsy With staph aureus infections uh, today, about 64% of staphylococcus aureus infections are CLABSI in the hospital and 36% are non clapsy with CLABSI or non clapsy 30-day and one-year mortality doesn't differ significantly. Complications are more significant in the non clapsy group when the staph infection or staph bloodstream infection is uh, in a different site than the catheter or is caused by a different site than the catheter. The relationship between peripheral IVs and midlines and nosocomial bacteria or bacteremia is really coming into its own. We're starting to really notice that. And we're starting to see some of the causative factors being emergent uh, peripheral IV placement without uh, good aseptic non-touch technique. Longer dwell times for those that uh, can stay in longer. Questionable IV sites. Now, how often in your practice do you really expect an IV catheter in the hand to last seven days or more. It's not gonna probably, or in the thumb or the finger. I used to be really proud when I worked only critical care before I knew more about vascular access of getting that nice peripheral IV, a 22, in the little finger, right in between the little finger and the next finger, the ring finger. And also inadequate care and maintenance are issues. These were ideas or, or these were uh, stats that were seen in studies by COVAX et al. Oops. Okay, so let's look at midline bloodstream infection versus a central venous catheter infection. We're going to use a couple different terms today for central venous catheter. We may call it a centrally inserted central catheter or CICC or a CVC, central venous catheter, depending on how an article refers to it or how a standard or guideline has referred to it. And sometimes we'll see that central venous access device. A midline catheter is inserted above the antecubital space with the catheter tip terminating at or below the level of the axilla. A midline is a peripheral vascular access device and the same considerations apply when infusing drugs and solutions as one would use of the peripheral IV. In essence, no vesicants or irritants. Midline dwell times are shown to be longer than peripheral IVs in current studies and have similar complications, which include rates of infection and venous thrombosis. 
The literature today reveals that midlines reported bloodstream infection rates of zero to 0.9%. The key word being reported because there is no reporting requirement. And in some hospitals, uh, epidemiology doesn't surveil for bloodstream infection from alternative devices other than central lines or central venous catheters. And so midlines as well as peripheral IVs are not reportable to the National Healthcare Safety Network. The data on this table comes from five hospital retrospective studies one year of data were collected and analyzed to compare infection rates between midlines and CVCs, or central venous catheters. The outcomes demonstrate the need to fully understand the risk when considering bloodstream infection risk reduction strategies. Two statistically significant outcomes can be concluded from the study. First, when monitored, midlines can have infection rate rates nearly as frequently as CVCs. Second, the incidence of midline bloodstream infection could have been significantly higher with like sample sizes. If you look, there were a hundred, wow, there were 165,166 catheter days in the CDC group versus 26,060 catheter days in the midline group. So actually, you know, it isn't apples and apples. Okay. When we look at CLABSIs related to PICs or reported by PICs, we see an approximate, gosh, this thing is just doing something. Um, we see that antimicrobial PICs have about a 0.2% incidence of CLABSI, where non-antimicrobial PICs are about 5.3%. This actually comes from the current literature. It's hard to define what the actual central venous catheters, uh, your short-term acute central venous catheters, are actually showing uh, with antimicrobial versus non-antimicrobial. The studies are out there, but they're not reported currently as what type of catheter, antimicrobial or non-antimicrobial. So patients with a greater baseline risk for CLABSI experienced greater CLABSI reduction too in these studies. When we look at, again, CLABSI from CVCs, in the US today, about 1.6 per thousand catheter days, trust me, I know, every hospital I go into has zero infections. Uh, you may have zero infections. What does that mean? zero CLABSIs. Uh, the national average is about 1.6 per thousand catheter days or more. With uncoded catheters, it's about 2.7 per thousand catheter days in the literature. CLABSI rates do remain higher with non-antimicrobial PICs as well as CVCs. We do see though that in the US, the predominant types of central venous catheters used are antimicrobial central venous catheters in hospitals in the US today. So what about our patient populations? Who's at risk of a CLABSI? Well, I'm kind of preaching to the choir. You guys are vascular access people. So we have to look at the diagnoses of the patient. Uh, and there are multiple considers, uh, factors to consider when placing a vascular access device. Many people talk about the CDC guidelines, but a lot of people don't realize they were somewhat replaced by the Shea Compendium published in 2014. And what the Shea Compendium says is that factors in, that, that you should consider include the diagnoses, specific diseases or illness, and looking at why the patient's in the hospital and what their intercurrent problems are. Where is the patient within the hospital? A lot of times we don't think about that. In your particular hospital, is there a higher infection rate in the ICU, the surgical ICU, or the respiratory ICU, or a med surge floor? We just kind of need to know that. 
Patients in critical care or oncology units are at an increased risk based on their typical diagnosis type. When we look at previous medical history, the healthcare providers should determine if there's anything in the patient's medical history that would prevent the ability to place a specific vascular access device. For example, a patient's had multiple vascular access devices and difficult placement. Uh, I think that's probably the vascular access specialist's favorite. Uh, the doctor can't get in central lines, uh, so you come to the ICU and put in a pick. Well, if they can't pass a central line, what makes them think we're going to get a pick into the central venous circulation? Or look at a patient with a history of venous thrombosis in the venous pathway also uh, that has developed stenosis or has a current thrombus. In the next section, we're gonna discuss risk in patients with a previous history of venous thrombosis. We also wanna look at comorbidities, intercurrent disease states, for example, chronic kidney disease, obesity, and diabetes, and there are many, many others. If we look at also patients that have multiple types of catheters, for example, a hemodialysis catheter, as well as a central venous catheter in place, or a patient that has a peripheral IV and an arterial catheter and a CVC in place. The other thing that affects it is how often a catheter is going to be accessed. That does increase uh, the risk with more accessions. Infusion of multiple medications or use of the device for frequent blood draws are additional examples of risk. If a catheter is placed emergently, it's important to note if the femoral site was used and if a sterile technique and maximal burial precautions were followed. A lot of people believe that in the emergency room, you can't perform sterile technique. I think that uh, at AVA in 2012, we actually had um, the chief of emergency medicine from the MISH or San Francisco General Hospital, one of the biggest and one of the busiest ERs in the country, talk to us about the fact that in her hospital, they never ever place a central line in the ER without using sterile technique. It doesn't really impact the time to central line in her practice. And she has published that in the American College of Emergency Physicians journal. We'll also talk about some of the recommendations for uh, protected technologies later. We need to look at the length of intended therapy and then we have to put on our crystal ball. Uh, what do we think the patient's going to do? Today, we have a patient with osteomyelitis. They have an order for 24 hours of vancomycin, then they're gonna do a peak and trough and decide what the dose is gonna be. Does that mean we only put in a peripheral IV because they're only getting 24 hours of vancomycin? No, we know a patient with osteomyelitis may need therapy for two weeks to six weeks, oftentimes, sometimes longer. So we need to put in an appropriate device that will meet their needs throughout the course of illness and treatment. And we have to look at potential for colonization. Here it goes again. I, so would I this be a good time to launch the next poll? Sure. Go ahead and do the poll, Chief. Okay. We're getting about 40% of the folks have voted. And I just did get confirmation that I can post a copy of the slides, so they will be in the handout section before the end of the show today. Okay. Okay. I'm going to close the poll. And share these results. So, do you use protected, simply inserted central catheters, non tunneled? 50% yes, 32% no, another 12% unsure, and then 6% say they depend on the patient. Thank you for participating on that. That's great. Yeah, it's an interesting concept because so many of the hospitals across the US do use protected catheters uh, for their short term acute central lines. Uh, one of the questions that always seems to come up is if you're putting in antimicrobial central lines routinely for specific patient types or for all patient types in your hospital, 
and you're not using antimicrobial picks or protected picks, is there a change in standard of care based on the type of catheter or who is placing the catheters? And is a change in the standard of care and in increasing the risk for infection for high-risk patients okay? And how do you prove that it is okay if you are reporting your CLABSI events for CVCs with protected catheters and with PICs, with non-protected catheters. How does that compare? What's the ratio? This slide has some really, really old information, um, but it's still being used out there. Um, way back when, when these first were published uh, by the Joint Commission, it was based on CDC information, and they were talking about CLABSIs occurring uh, at the rate of about 80,000 per year in ICUs, at about 250,000 across the board in hospitals. About 20% CLABSI incidents resulted in mortality, and the CDC estimated that the annual cost of CLABSI was more than 1 billion when this is done, when these uh, statistics were done. We have to really look at uh, what's going on. If you go back to 2018, there were only about 14,000 infections reported to NHSN, or CLABSI infections reported to NHSN that year. We are seeing the mortality actually a little higher in the literature, up to 30 and 35%, uh, sometimes a little higher, with the increase in gram negative uh, bloodstream infections or gram-negative bacteria cause bloodstream infections as well as fungal infections. And the emergence of the antibiotic or antimicrobial resistant pathogens, which that resistance is often caused by a gene uh, with a specific pathogen and What's really strange to me, because I'm not a good microbiologist, I guess, is how that gene can jump from, say, Pseudomonas to Serratia. How can the same gene jump from one pathogen to the other pathogen, and then suddenly it becomes resistant to the same antibiotics as a different pathogen? It's just something interesting. It could be evolution, but it's strange to see the same gene analyzed at how it jumps. It's not only uh, important to consider the cost to your facility, but also the cost to the patient. And a lot of times uh, when we read reports or when we report uh, what's going on in our own hospital or area, we always say, well, you know, the cost of a, a bloodstream infection could be $45,000 just one bloodstream, catheter-related bloodstream infection. The reality is, is the national average is right around 11 to 13,000 for the hospital cost of that, blood, of that catheter-related bloodstream infection versus what the patient's insurance or payer is being billed, which would be the $45,000. So there's a big difference between hospital cost and patient cost. And so sometimes we are seeing more and more people really break that down into hospital costs or stating hospital costs when they're calculating hospital costs, because it can be really, really confusing. Let's look at some of the healthcare acquired infection programs and metrics. Two programs that were implemented by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, are the value-based purchasing program and the HACC or healthcare acquired condition reduction program. Value-based purchasing and HACC programs were designed to reduce adverse events, increase transparency of hospital quality to consumers, healthcare providers, and others, as well as to provide recognition and rewards to hospitals that provide high quality care at lower cost to the patient. These hospital, uh, these, this program particularly has had a great effect 
on hospital revenue since its implementation. For fiscal year 2020, which started in October 1st, 2019, and goes through September 30th of 2020, there is a set of complex measurements and calculation in four value-based purchasing domains. Uh, each domain is given a weighted score, and they include clinical outcomes, person and community engagement and efficiency, safety, and cost reduction. In 2020, each domain carries a 25% weight in these calculations. CLABC, which is now reported as SIR, Standardized Infection Ratio, uh, is the observed CLABC rate in a facility uh, compared to the number of predicted CLABCs based on a national baseline. So CLABC SIR is used in calculations in both clinical outcomes and the safety and efficiency domains. So you get a double whammy for each CLABC in that one. The hospital value-based purchasing program is funded by reducing hospitals' base operating MSDRG payments by 2%. And any leftover funds are redistributed to hospitals based on their total performance score across those domains. In other words, some hospitals will get incentive payments if they're really high performing and penalties or additional penalties may actually even be given to poor performing hospitals. The HAP reduction program or healthcare acquired condition reduction program is a Medicare pay for performance program that supports CMS's longstanding effort to link Medicare to healthcare quality in the inpatient setting. With this one, the Director of Health and Human Services or the Secretary of Health and Human Services has, has to adjust payments to hospitals that rank in the worst performing 25th percentile of all hospitals with respect to hospital acquired quality measures. Hospitals with a total HAP score greater than the 75th percentile of all total HAP scores which are the worst performing quartile, have an additional 1% payment reduction. And this one's in arrears, not up front. So that payment adjustment applies to all medical discharges this year between October 1st, 2019 and September 30th, 2020. The payment reduction in this place occurs when the hospital claims are paid. So we also have to look at other hospital acquired conditions uh, that are reported. CLABC, CAUTI, surgical site infections, C. difficile, and MRSA bacteremia. If we look at the difference in the two programs, a hospital may risk reduction of payments overall by about 3%. And many of the private payers are actually doing this type of a scheme also. It's not just Medicare and Medicaid. So let's talk a little about catheter-related thrombotic conditions. There's been a limited focus on catheter-related thrombosis, or CRT. Some people call it catheter-related venous thrombosis. The worst uh, name for it is catheter-related DVT, because it's not always a DVT and it's not always symptomatic, so they may not have been diagnosed with DVT. So catheter-related thrombosis or catheter-related venous thrombosis is the appropriate terminology. We're gonna talk uh, about how we can start looking at this, uh, doing improved surveillance and treatment for these patients. And we'll talk about risk factors, symptoms, and caution when symptoms aren't, aren't present, costs associated with catheter-related thrombosis, as well as a potential relationship to catheter-related thrombosis and infection, or with catheter-related thrombosis and infection. Hopefully, that's going to help us answer the question, can we avoid catheter-related thrombosis, or can we prevent it? 
So let's go back to Virchow's triad from the 19th century. Many people still teach this as the primary mode uh, for thrombus formation, where the pa patient can have any or all of the following. They can have circulatory stasis or changes in circulatory status would be a better term because turbulence in a, in a vein uh, will actually trigger some of the clotting factors and the clotting cascade. So it's not just stasis, it's also turbulence and velocity of the blood flow. Vessel damage. And how often do we damage vessels during vascular access? Well, I think if you put a needle through something, you're damaging it. And also hypercoagulable states. Many of our patients um, are hypercoagulable in the hospital, uh, particularly your dehydrated patients. Uh, they can be from congenital anomalies um, or other things. So we really have to look at immobility uh, as well as vessel endothelial dysfunction and damage uh, and any inflammatory process. Central venous catheters can impact this triad in all aspects and even peripheral catheters can cause a catheter-related thrombosis. Additionally, the catheter body material itself can provide a stimulus to create an environment favoring thrombosis. In the US, we rarely use those materials today. We're using more of the polyurethanes as well as silicones for all of our types of vascular access devices where in other parts of the world, they're still using uh, polyvinyl chloride as well as Teflon type catheters. So let's look at these components a little bit better. Hypercoagulability, it's just abnormal clotting factors. It can be caused by a previous DVT or catheter-related thrombosis. Uh, it can be related to ethnicity, age, malignancy, trauma, pregnancy, hormone replacement therapy, and any inflammatory process. So when a vessel is injured, the body's response is to form a clot to stop bleeding or protect the area of injury. The coagulation process is stimulated and platelets become activated, become sticky, and they trap other blood cells and they stimulate cytokines and chemokines to form a clot, the other factors along the clotting cascade. Normal coagulation is essential for healing, though coagulopathies for blood clotting disorders impair that coagulation process. A tendency to develop thrombo uh, thromboses is a result sometimes of inherited or congenital factors or even molecular defects that have been acquired, where hypocoagulability is a condition of irregular and slow clotting and prevents normal clotting that can lead to bleeding. Coagulopathies may be caused by structural or functional abnormalities of the blood vessel, platelets, or coag factors that may be caused by all of those different factors we just listed. So we have to really uh, look at identifying the presence and the potential risk for coagulopathies or uh, for each patient that we're gonna place a central venous catheter in particularly and ensure that we include vascular access in vascular access device selection and vascular access that part of your assessment. Are any of those things going on? So venous stasis, or if you want to call it changes in blood flow, because it's not just slowing of blood flow or static blood flow. It's also high velocity blood flow or turbulent blood flow. We see stasis or slowing in dehydrated patients, patients with leukocytosis, uh, patients that have a large catheter, it actually doesn't cause stasis, which a lot of people do believe is that a big catheter causes slower blood flow. Think about putting your foot in a stream of flowing water. Run out to the gutter and do it now. No, not really. 
But if you put your foot in a little stream of water and you look down, you'll notice that it's flowing normally till it reaches your foot. Suddenly, it becomes turbulence and you see little currents and eddies and you see the blood flow or the, the water flow, whatever you're standing in. Actually, the velocity increases until that partial obstruction is not present. So it can cause turbulent blood flow and higher velocity, which stimulates the clotting cascade. Another thing is the size of the catheter versus the vessel, vessel the catheter to vessel ratio. Um, in the infusion therapy standards of practice from INS, it does say that we shouldn't uh, put a catheter in a vein that takes up more than 45% or 45% or more than the actual diameter of the vessel. And again, that can help reduce that turbulent uh, flow or that high velocity flow when the blood reaches that and it helps stop those currents and eddies. The other thing is sometimes we have patients with tumors that are compressing the vessel. Uh, that can also cause changes in blood flow uh, and, as well as the creation of thrombus. And Sometimes we're just using veins that are just too small for the types of catheters. And this does include peripheral venous catheters as well as arterial catheters. And a lot of times we don't think of those things. We're always considering some of these thrombotic complications as synonymous with central venous catheters or PICs. And actually they occur with PICs and central venous catheters almost the, at the same rate, okay? And Peripheral catheters also have them. Let's look at risk factors for endothelial damage and vessel damage. We know that a high or low pH is a player in whether or not it's irritating uh, or damaging to the vessel. We know that high or low osmolarity can cause vascular changes. The body wants to maintain homeostasis. So it will suck fluid from the cells of the vein wall, or it may push fluid into the cells of the vein wall, depending on whether the patient is in a dehydrated state or you're giving a hyper or hypoosmolar solution. Traumatic vessel cannulation, well, heck, what's that? Um, gee, in a lot of places, uh, we have those old rules. Um, this, it's driving me crazy, sorry. Um, we have those old rules uh, that say, well, one person could stick a patient twice. But a lot of policies are now saying it's two people, two times. Other places are it's two times by an unlimited number of people. So we have multiple insertion attempts damaging vessels. Another thing is large bore introducers or sheaths or sheath dilators. We have to really look at the size and can we minimize the size of an introducer needle or uh, sheath slash dilator uh, or dilator uh, when we're doing a procedure or do we just do it the way we've always done it? How about making repetitive passes through the subclavian? I think we've all seen those people that are uh, kind of like going in and out, in and out, in and out. And this was much more common when ultrasound wasn't used for subclavian or axillary access. And today with ultrasound, we don't see that repeated in and out, in and out uh, damaging the vessel. Placement in an area of, this is a typo, uh, an area of flexion, uh, can also cause a problem with the catheter because when you're flexing and you bend, the catheter bends and it can rub up against that vein wall. And again, catheter size, previous catheters, left-sided catheters, and femoral IJ or subclavians may have more damage. Uh, also, suboptimal tip location of the catheter 
catheters that are high in the SCC actually have a higher rate of superior vena cava or brachiocephalic thrombosis than patients that have a catheter tip, a central venous catheter tip placed in the lower third of the superior vena cava. From the old studies on midclavicular catheters, we know the catheters with tips placed into the axillary vein uh, actually result in a fairly high incidence of thrombosis because of that vessel or endothelial damage. So a midline, which some people have in the past used a 20 centimeter midline and just threaded it all the way from the upper arm. Well, where's the tip? Is it in the axillary vein? If it is, then that's dangerous to the patient. It shouldn't be above the, ax the line, the imaginary line that you draw across from the axillary fold around the deltoid or the insertion of the deltoid. Length of therapy can also have a real impact on this. So we have to look at all of these factors when we're doing our vascular access assessment. This illustration just actually shows that when we're giving something that is hyperosmolar or uh, that has a pH that is non-physiological, uh, that you can get stripping literally of the endothelial cells that make up the tunica intima. And when we get that stripping, it causes the release of cytokines and chemokines from that subendothelial layer, creating a clot. So it does, again, increase the risk of venous thrombosis. So let's look at symptomatic versus asymptomatic thrombosis. Most of us are really focused on symptomatic thrombosis. And uh, we've seen the articles and we're seeing newer and newer research on venous thrombosis and more talk about what we call asymptomatic thrombosis, which I'll talk about. A thrombus can be occlusive, it can completely obst obstruct blood flow in the vessel, or it can be non-occlusive, where the vessel has some or maintains some blood flow. Symptoms can be leakage of fluid at the catheter exit site, edema, collateral circulation formation. We see those little uh, uh, collateral veins forming, those little spider veins forming in the neck, chest, or extremity. Discoloration of the extremity. Patients that have unexplained fever or pain. It may also result in loss of catheter function when a thrombus forms at the tip of the catheter and surrounds the tip of the catheter. That type of thrombus has just as great a risk, if not greater, as it's not as easily identified because sometimes we'll have a thrombus uh, attached to a fibrin sheath and the fluid's coming up the fibrin sheath and still exiting into the vein, but it's not occluding the vein. A risk benefit assessment should be performed to determine if we have a symptomatic thrombosis. We should look at that. Do we need to remove the catheter? Or should we treat the patient appropriately to anti with anticoagulants uh, to treat the thrombosis while leaving a functional catheter in place? According to the current standards and guidelines, a catheter should not automatically be removed if there's no sign of infection and the catheter is still needed for treatment. And I know I've talked to vascular access nurses in a lot of places and they have taken in articles and things, they just can't seem to uh, make that fly in their own institutions, but we can still try. One of the things about removing a catheter, if we need to put it in on a different side, it can increase the risk of bilateral thrombosis uh, rather than just a one-sided thrombosis. And remember, catheter removal alone is not going to really treat that thrombus. It's really just going to treat the catheter. In fact, it may even release the thrombus or cause it to be dislodged and become a venous thromboembolism. Okay, so let's look at those. 
Asymptomatic thrombosis are much more common than we really think they are. So we really need to determine device necessity in, uh, every day and every shift. And we need to assess its functionality every day, every shift. And we need to treat thrombus if we have any signs and symptoms or suspect it. And some of the literature, there is no consensus. Some of the literature says should we that we should anticoagulate patients to prevent catheter-related venous thrombosis. But the bulk of the studies are showing that prophylactic anticoagulation really doesn't help. So it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Some people believe we should, some people believe we shouldn't. We should just follow what our hospital actually uh, determines as our policy and procedure. With central venous access, a CVC, and here we're talking about uh, any central venous access device, including PICS, uh, symptomatic venous thrombosis occurs somewhere between 5 and 20% of the time, 5% and 20% of the time with central venous catheters. And this is from a meta-analysis in the literature. Asymptomatic thrombosis, though, does occur somewhere between 33% and 58% of the time. In fact, there was one study that shows it's upwards of 80%. But if we look at the broad-based studies, we're seeing asymptomatic is 33% to 58%. Now, how do we tell if we have an asymptomatic thrombosis? Well, someone's done a duplex ultrasound study to look at the existence of thrombus in the vessel uh, along the path of the catheter during the study. Uh, and so we can tell in that case if catheter-related venous thrombosis is occurring. It varies due to the diagnostic modality that's being used. Some people believe that you can just use our regular ultrasound to diagnose uh, venous thrombosis. Mm, you might be able to see it, you might not. If we're using pulse Doppler, sure, we can tell if there's alteration in flow. And in some cases, they still use venograms to really detect areas that may be old rhombus or obstructions or partial obstructions in flow. Upper extremity deep vein thrombosis in one of the studies that we looked at were are between five and 10% of all adult deep vein thrombosis. 30 to 50% of cases of pediatric DVT involve the upper extremities and may be related to catheters or central venous catheters. So it's quite interesting uh, when we look at the incidence and how this can be a problem. So let's look at PIC uh, catheter-related venous thrombosis. Again, it's gotten a lot of attention over the past few years. Uh, so a lot of people have you know, kind of forgotten that the incidence is mm, pretty much the same with a short-term acute CVC as it is with a PIC, because we're, we're looking at PICs more and more. Symptomatic thrombus in patients with cancer, about 0.3% to 28%, and without cancer, 2 to 5.5%. Mortality or increased mortality secondary to that thrombus is estimated to be one to 2% in patients without cancer and estimated to be two to 4% in patients with cancer. PICs are associated with a greater risk of central venous catheters than other central venous catheters in one study. But some of the other studies are not showing that and some of the meta-analyses are not showing that. They're saying, they may be equal, but we need to do better studies on both symptomatic and asymptomatic thrombosis. We do see a greater incidence of recurrent DVT with a history of DVT or venous thrombosis, and that there is a much greater risk of thrombosis in patients with 
a malignancy or with large ticks, five to six French, uh, though that may be the studies that were done. We need a lot more um, information. So when we're considering the use of a PIC versus a centrally inserted central catheter or CICC, should we um, think that a PIC is less problematic for a patient that's going to be in an ICU uh, and have a short course of hospitalization versus a patient that needs long-term central venous access? Of course, we have to look at all those other uh, assessment factors too. So if we look at venous thromboembolism um, or healthcare-acquired venous thromboembolism, this again is one of those uh, statistical uh, reports from uh, the CDC as well as NHSN. As many as 900,000 Americans are affected by blood clots leading to approximately 100,000 premature deaths annually in the US. As many as 70% are preventable, and fewer than 50% receive appropriate preventive treatment. Now, we see this slide being used all over the place. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. Uh, the associated healthcare costs of VTE is about $10 billion annually. That's a lot. So if we stop and think about it, this is referring to lower extremity DVT primarily. Very few times do people report as a deep vein thrombosis the incidence of deep vein thrombosis outside of the lower extremities or pulmonary embolus caused by a thrombus from the lower extremities versus the upper extremities, where we see that there's a higher risk with upper extremity uh, venous thrombosis. So as far as prevention, there are documents and all hospitals today are required to have programs to reduce venous thrombosis, lower extremity venous thrombosis. And they've been implemented throughout healthcare. What about our catheter-related venous thrombosis? What can we do? Are we using protocols that can prevent it and prevent catheter-related venous thrombosis. As far as the relationship between infection and thrombosis, a um, great lecture at Ava uh, a few years ago, it was actually a point counterpoint on which comes first, infection or thrombosis. Um, at that presentation, it was really interesting because a very gifted presenters, uh, one being Marsha Ryder, and there was no conclusion, which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Hmm, yeah. So Dr. Rad and colleagues at MD Anderson did a post-mortem study in 72 cancer patients. Their findings were that in those cancer patients, they saw pathological changes in 49% of their veins that contained a catheter. They had 38% incidence of neural thrombosis in veins that actually contained a catheter. Catheter-related sepsis was only seen in seven of those 72 cancer patients, but there were no patients in this group that had sepsis without thrombus. So that was kind of an interesting one. So is there a relationship? The conclusion was yes. Dr. Timzit and colleagues in France looked at a critical care studies looking at 208 catheters in three ICUs. Their findings were that 10 out of 139 catheters, or 7.2% uh, of those resulted in catheter-related sepsis without thrombosis. 13 of 69 of the patients had catheter-related sepsis with thrombosis, 18.8%. And when catheter-related thrombosis was present, the risk or incidence of catheter-related infection increased 2.6-fold. 
So yeah, we do have those, those issues. And then we're looking for all of those venous changes. So venous thrombosis is a real problem and should be something that we are giving as much consideration to with vascular access as we do plapsy and catheter-related bloodstream infections. So let's look at protected technologies. If we look at the CDC guidelines, uh, 2011 CDC guidelines revised in 2017, uh, they state to use an antimicrobial or antiseptic catheters in adults uh, if hospital units or patient populations with FLABC, uh, your rate is above institutional goals despite basic FLABC prevention practices. Shea has gone ahead and even increased that, okay? Um, the CDC showed that chlorhexidines, uh, chlorhexidine slash silver sulfidizing combination catheters or minocycline rifampin impregnated catheters uh, should be used in patients that have a catheter in place greater than five days, a central venous catheter greater than five days. Uh, particularly if they have uh, a higher rate than expected from their actual interventions that they put in place to lower. With the Shea Compendium published in 2014 and endorsed by the CDC, so kind of takes a little precedence over those old CDC guidelines when it comes to this, it recommended the use of antiseptic or antimicrobial impregnated CDCs in adults based on the highest possible level of clinical evidence. And their criteria included they should use catheters in units, hospital units, or patient populations with a CLABC rate above institutional goals, despite basic CLABC prevention policies. In essence, uh, if you have a high risk area in your hospital, you may need to use that in all patients. We also should be using them in patients with limited venous access in a history of recurrent CLABC or patients at heightened risk of the severe sequelae from FLABC, such as implanted intravascular devices, prosthetic heart valves, aortic grafts, those types of things, neutropenic patients, transplant patients, immunocompromised patients, such as burn patients, and critically ill patients. Hmm, well, gee, that kind of fits most of our patients, doesn't it? So we ought, you know, we should be considering the use appropriately because protected catheters have been shown to reduce FLABSI when used in an emergency room setting also or during an emergent setting. So there are many criteria, and this is just a listing uh, of all of the different criteria that, that can be used to determine if a patient would benefit from a protected catheter technology. These are all of these criteria listed in the infusion therapy standards of practice. And do you see these types of patients? Hmm, interesting. We all have, I think, and most of our patients in the hospital are pretty sick today. We don't usually put uh, vascular access devices in people that aren't. So let's go on and talk a little bit about how catheter infection occurs. And again, this is somewhat repetitive for the vascular access specialist, but it's always good to review. Hands of medical personnel or the hands of the patient. Hub colonization, failure to actually clean the hub or a needleless connector. Skin microflora, failure for good care and maintenance protocols uh, and use of things that actually reduce the risk of bacterial contamination down the path of the catheter, as well as we can have that bacteria in the sub-Q tract, uh, and we can also have infection related to hematogenous seeding from other sites of infection. So these are the five 
common sources. And the biggest thing we can do naturally is hand washing. Okay. Also, uh, we need to look at the fact that we can scrub all we want with our chlorhexidine alcohol solutions, and we're still not reaching those bacteria down in the sub-Q layers uh, of, uh, and in the fatty layers as, and, and other tissue layers. We're just cleaning the surface of the skin. So care and maintenance is really important, as well as insertion prevention techniques. So how does contact cause that colonization? Well, first of all, bugs like a nutrient-rich environment. So they're much, much better uh, nutrient than blood. Uh, it's proteins, sugars, all kinds of goodies for them to eat young. They have to have a surface for attachment so they can attach to the catheter or to a fibrin sheath on the catheter. They need to have minimal competition with other pathogens. And it doesn't even take 24 hours for colonization to occur. So we really have to look at bacterial or fungal biofilms forming independent of a surface for attachment also. Newer studies are showing that. And we should see it with an infection, some sort of direct contact of a microorganism with the catheter surface, either internal or external. Just the touch of the cell wall with a biomaterial in a nutrient-rich environment with minimum competition can result in attachment to the catheter and biofilm formation or replication and then biofilm formation. So let's uh, just look at a couple of pictures. The image on the left is uh, some complex biofilm. You can see the coxae uh, in there, the little round structures, uh, and you can see some cross-linked fibrin uh, as well as some blood cells there. Um, we can see that's uh, on a catheter surface, on the outside of a catheter surface, under um, uh, the microscope. On the right, we can see the presence of biofilm, and I'm gonna kind of point where we can tell it's biofilm that's right here, uh, because it's actually colonization. That patient has a pretty, complex fibrin sheath over the catheter. You can see some catheter here. Uh, you can see some of the other biofilm here. And you can see fibrin sheath, which is this kind of shiny reddish yellowish part over the catheter. We also see a lot of thrombus in the wall, on the walls of this catheter, probably related to that. Um, not on the walls of the catheter, but on the walls of the vessel. I'm sorry. Uh, so we're seeing biofilm, thrombin, and fibrin sheath formation. When we look at extraluminal catheter surfaces, it only takes one bug to start reproducing and to colonize and create biofilms. Unfortunately, our antibiotic treatments actually don't penetrate those biofilms. And so many times that patient can uh, be treated and then have a subsequent um, infection secondary to those biofilms that are still present because you get those little floaters off the biofilm causing infection in different parts of the body or a generalized infection such as a bloodstream infection. We know that significant amounts of biofilm can form within three days after catheter insertion. And they do tend to form on external surfaces of catheters that have been in place for less than 10 days. And with increasing catheter duration, we see biofilms forming inside the catheter lumen. Current research is showing that 72% of reported cases of PLABC today are what we consider late onset or greater than five days after insertion, likely related to contamination during use, 
care and maintenance of the central venous catheter. On the right, we see intraluminal colonization. Uh, again, the internal lumen is shown to be the primary site of contamination with short-term acute CVCs, ticks, et cetera, uh, as early as four to six days after insertion, significant biofilm, but it can occur any time. And intraluminal colonization is a major source of infection for the long term. What I'd like to do now is just play a little video for you. And what I'd like you to do is just look at the video and count the number of times this person's hands, gloved hands actually, come in contact with the skin catheter or components of the insertion of a PIC catheter. So, I want you to count, uh, count them if you can. And there's a counter on the screen, so it kind of cheats. So we're seeing, you know, patients getting scrubbed pretty good. It's, uh, it's, this is sped up quite a bit. <laughs> Establishing their sterile field, their gown, their glove. Now they're touching the surface of the skin. Even though we've prepped, have we removed all that bacteria? Absolutely not. Marking the skin, we touch the needle, we put the needle through the skin. Now we're touching the guide wire as it goes in through the introducer needle, over and over and over again. Now, that wire is still being touched, the sheath is being touched, or the dilator is being touched, and the catheter is being touched as a thread over and over and over. And if you've noticed, the fingers come in contact with the skin, which may or may not be clean. One of the things we really have to think about is that the First five epidermal layers of the skin contain 80% of resident and transient skin flora. And even with rigorous use of a broad spectrum prep solution and using sterile technique, we still have 20% of our normal skin flora or acquired skin flora on the skin. So in that, 110 times, 110 times that was that the hands came in contact. So if we stop and think about how many times we actually touch the surface of the catheter and all of that, it brings us, you know, we're, we're really focused today on aseptic non-touch technique for the placement of short peripheral catheters. Um, but what about trying to use some sort of an aseptic non-touch during a sterile procedure too? something to think about and to look at how often we may be contaminating our gloves and then setting the patient up for the potential for an infection. So let's look at protected catheters or the types of technologies that we have available today in the US. Um, these catheters are either antiseptic impregnated or antibiotic coated. Uh, they can be called antimicrobial catheters, antibiotic catheters, whatever. The broad term is antimicrobial uh, catheters. Some can actually have antithrombogenic properties as uh, alone or may combine antimicrobial and antithrombogenic properties. Currently in the US, we have central venous catheters with what's called AeroGuard Blue, AeroGuard Blue Plus, and AeroGuard Blue Advanced Protection. The top two are fluorhexine silver sulfidizing. Uh, advanced is chlorhexidine alone on the inside and outside of the catheter, and spectrum technology, which is the minocycline rifampin uh, coated catheter that's available in the United States. With antithrombogenic, the AeroGuard Blue Advanced catheter is not only antimicrobial, it is uh, antithrombogenic. And then we have Indexo technology which does have antithrombogenic properties. Uh, rather than being a coating or impregnation, Indexo technology is a blended polymer 
that forms the catheter that actually resists attachment uh, to the catheter of cells, blood cells, or stuff, if you, if you say. Um, so we do have these types of things available uh, in the U.S., and they're all designed uh, to somewhat, uh, the antithrombogenic, I mean, the antimicrobial ones are designed to significantly reduce microbial colonization on or within a catheter. Uh, and the antithrombogenic ones may, just because they don't allow attachment as well, uh, may also have a minor effect on that. So we really have to kind of look at that when we're choosing what type of protected technology we're using. So let's look at the antimicrobial. Antibiotics are bacteriostatic or bactericidal, some or both. Um, bacteriostatic just means that it actually inhibits that bacteria or fungus from replicating. Where bactericidal means it's killed on contact or within a specific amount of time on contact. These can be effective against gram positive as well as gram negative for organisms, but they're slightly weaker for the protection against the gram negatives. And they can be ineffective uh, against some of the fungal pathogens. And their primary purpose is uh, that antibiotic and to reduce infection. Where your an antiseptic catheter, another type of antimicrobial, is bactericidal. It kills on contact or within a certain amount of time of exposure of an organism. It's shown to be very broad spectrum, all gram-positive and gram-negative organisms that are associated with central line uh, bloodstream infections uh, are affected, and it's effective against all of your fungal pathogens. It actually damages the cell wall, inhibiting that cell function, causing it to die because all its contents spill out. So let's look at antithrombogenic technologies. You have a non-eluding technology. Um, if you're familiar with uh, drug-eluting stents, uh, stents coated with or impregnated with uh, some sort of a substance, and it gives off or releases a certain amount of that substance over time. Uh, that is an eluding technology. So with your antiseptic catheters and your antibiotic catheters, uh, it is the actual coating or impregnated substance is released both intraluminally and extraluminally over time. When we talk about the antimicrobial type catheters that are eluding and are antithrombogenic, which is only one, we know that it's a chlorhexidine impregnated catheter and chlorhexidine actually inhibits thrombin formation, a major component of the clotting cascade. So at or near the catheter surface and around the catheter surface, it actually will inhibit clot formation. Um, where your non-eluting technologies, such as your Indexo, it resists platelets and other blood cells from adhering to the catheter surface, as well as may inhibit pathogens from adhering uh, to the catheter surface. Uh, I keep getting this. What we see is the antimicrobial effect of your Antibiotic coated catheters, uh, they are, uh, they do reduce infection, have been shown to reduce infection. Where, and your eluding catheters, particularly your combination, silver sulfur diazine and chlorhexidine or chlorhexidine alone, 
uh, do provide a four log reduction of pathogen on the surface of the catheter or if the cap if they come in contact with the catheter. So that's 99.99% of any bacteria that may form on the catheter. Uh, as well, uh, that's, that's a pretty high one. When we start looking at uh, other things that we use that may have a lower log reduction. So let's look at bundles really quickly. When we look at insertion bundles, and we're all familiar with the insertion bundles, so I'd like to kind of move through that one somewhat quickly. Uh, the compliance with the central line bundle is measured using a checklist from the observer. We're all familiar with this one. Hand hygiene, use of maximal sterile barrier precautions during insertion of central lines as well as arterial lines placed in certain areas of the body. Use of a chlorhexidine-based solution or chlorhexidine alcohol solution for antisepsis, optimal catheter site selection, avoiding the femoral uh, or subclavian veins, I'm sorry, femoral or jugular veins for central venous access in adult patients, and a daily review of line necessity. But let's also look at our post-insertion bundle. Many of you have post-insertion bundles. This particular bundle was suggested by Joint Commission several years ago as a way of having effective reduction in your routine care and maintenance and use of central venous catheters. Hand hygiene, that line necessity, it absolutely says the same thing. All of your injection ports, needless connectors need to be clean before and after each access to that. Many of us are using the little catheter protectors, uh, the little alcohol-based protectors on our needles connectors, but that still does not preclude us from cleaning that site or that port between and after use. We should be using aseptic technique with all line access, with peripheral catheters, an aseptic non-touch technique, and we need to be using aseptic sterile technique or surgical technique uh, when we're doing central venous access devices or certain types of arterial lines. We have rules on set replacement, and today our infusates are all prepared using aseptic technique. And We've all gone through the training over and over and over again with this. So bundles do help. So how do we reduce colonization? Again, hand hygiene, good care and maintenance, maybe the use of catheter lock solutions. Currently in the US, we don't have any antimicrobial lock solutions um, available or cleared by the FDA, uh, where in other countries they do. Um, we also have good lure caps and antimicrobial caps that can be placed on ports, et cetera, and we should be doing good scrubbing. Extraluminally, we should always be using actual barrier precautions when inserting. We should use uh, antimicrobial dressings if appropriate, and we should be using good skin preparation. Passive methods of prevention include the use of antimicrobial catheters and antimicrobial needleless connectors, which are available. Extraluminally, our antimicrobial catheters and antimicrobial dressings do have been shown in the literature to show uh, or to reduce the incidence of CLABSI. Organizations such as CDC, SHEA, the Infection Diseases Society of America, Infusion Nurses Society, American Society of Anesthesiologists, the operating, uh, I'm sorry, the perioperative nurses, uh, as well as the KDOKI guidelines all have language around the use of antimicrobial catheters appropriately in order to decrease your risk. Antimicrobial catheters can 
truly reduce colonization based on the technology and on the specific device chosen. There aren't antimicrobial catheters available in all types of catheters today. It's just PICs uh, and central venous catheters and only some central venous catheters and dialysis catheters. Okay. So let's look at just a, uh, take a quick look at an algorithm for device selection. We keep talking about risk, costs, uh, that are associated with some of our negative outcomes and the importance of catheter technologies. So how do we, how do we decide who gets what? Well, in some hospitals, again, uh, we do see protected technologies used for all centrally inserted short-term acute central catheters, uh, a, but not so much with peripherally inserted central catheters. Um, so it, it can be an either or whether the hospital chooses or you choose to go with all antimicrobial catheters or antithrombogenic catheters and or some patients get antithrombogenic anti and antithrombotic. Um, antimicrobial and antithrombogenic catheters, boy, I got tongue twister there. Um, so when we look at this algorithm, and I, I'm sorry, my computer's doing very weird things. Um, in the non-emergent setting, we still want to look at the type of infusate, pH, osmolarity, chemical properties, all that kind of stuff. If the patient doesn't require a central catheter, then we need to look at the proposed duration of therapy and decide whether a standard peripheral IV or ultrasound guided peripheral IV uh, is going to be appropriate. The patient may be on therapy for less than one week or if an extended dwell peripheral catheter midline or protected midline may be appropriate for those patients with uh, the need for infusion greater than one week. If they need central and they have a, a chronic kidney disease stage three or greater, then we should probably be using a small bore central access or acute hemodialysis catheter with an infusion uh, lumen, or if they don't have CKD, we may want to use a PIC or a protected PIC if they're going to have longer term uh, therapy. In the emergent setting, the emergency room, do they need have, uh, or should they be getting peripheral access? No, they should get a CVC or an interosseous device. Yes, if they're getting central infusates or they need CVP monitoring for some reason, uh, then we should be placing a central venous catheter, including a PIC or a protected CVC slash PIC. Or no, if they don't have those, an extended dwell peripheral IV or ultrasound guided peripheral may be more appropriate. So this is just an example. So we've actually reviewed the incidence of bloodstream infection and how it can impact our patients, uh, morbidity and mortality inside and outside the hospital. We know that complications can be asymptomatic or symptomatic and have great financial implications. We should always be taking care and precautions so that no matter what the vascular access device, the patient has, gets a reduced risk for associated thrombosis or other complications whenever possible. We understand how contamination occurs and we understand the different types of technologies. In addition to the use of protected technologies, insertion and post-insertion bundles are super important when it comes to reducing infections and both active and passive methods can be used. That's all I really have, so thank you very much. Um, Judy, do you want to entertain questions? I would love to entertain questions. Jim, that was great. Thanks so much. Yeah. I appreciate your expertise, your knowledge. We are running a little late. Um, you guys, mm -hmm. we did change the certificate um, to be 1.5 CE. Uh, if you need to leave, 
you guys will get a C an email to get your CE in about mm, 10 minutes or so, right after the end of this the webinar. But we want you to stay if you can. We do have some questions, and Jim, um, the O question came. Will the survey be resent to those who already took it? Yes, you will. You will get a survey after the end of the, this. So you'll get an email, even if you want to, and already click the CR code to do it. So let's get to some questions, okay, Jim? Sure. All righty. Is there any thought about pick insertion on the same arm where an A-line is inserted in the radial artery? What's your thoughts? <laughs> well, there's, there aren't any current restrictions. Uh, you know, that is multiple vascular access device, but A-lines are important and needed in some of our patients. Um, so, you know, should you use the opposite? I'm, I'm assuming they mean, should you use the opposite arm? I've seen no research on that, uh, pro or con. The thing is, with an arterial line, you do run the risk of um, a fairly high risk of infection based on the data out there today, as well as a fairly high risk of thrombosis uh, with improper securement, particularly of an arterial line moving around in the vessel and depending on where it is. So using the same side, you know, may be preferred, I, but there's, there's nothing out there that says yay or nay that I'm aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a difference between vanco trough levels when draw, drawn from, sorry, a PIC <laughs> slash CVC and when drawn peripherally? There does, be, <laughs> there does not seem to be any clear evidence to avoid PIC CVC. Um, it, I can only say sometimes to that because uh, I, I, I did go to a, a pathology conference one time, and they were talking about blood draws through central lines and uh, picks other, other types of lines. And the one thing they pointed out is that every hospital has different protocols for blood draws. They may use different types of, of blood tubes from a different manufacturer. They may use different collection techniques, uh, and they use different machines to run their samples. Uh, not all uh, drug levels are done on the same type of machine in all hospitals. So the idea is, is that we should be checking to see if we have correlation between catheter drawn specimens and peripheral drawn specimens in our own practice setting to determine whether it is appropriate or you're going to have uh, a difference in uh, trough levels. I hope that helps. Uh, there's not a lot out there in the literature about it, but it's talked about a lot. Thank you, Jim. Can you elaborate why a left-sided insertion site is riskier for vessel damage? Sure. With a central line, um, if you look from the left side, it's a, it's a longer pathway and a tiny bit more tortuous pathway as the catheter comes across the chest and then down into the lower third of the superior vena cava. You get an arc and that uh, more of an arc right there rubbing like right at the brachiocephalic and, and superior vena cava area. Uh, and that arc can extend a little bit. So with movement of the shoulder and arm, that catheter can be rubbing back and forth a little bit on that vessel wall. So that's why we really prefer uh, the right side just because it's a shorter trajectory and there's not as much arc right there at the superior vena cava uh, brachiocephalic junction. Thank you. Now with CHG impregnated picks, manufacturer says effective for one month. However, as you say, they can get a collapse mm -hmm. in three days with an insertion. Does that mean CHG was ineffective? Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, I mean, no, they, nothing is going to 100% prevent collapses. We do see a significant reduction in chlorhexidine impregnated catheters. There's uh, no panacea, is there? Yeah, there just is no panacea. Um, the elution profile is the minute it gets into the bloodstream, okay, the minute you get into the bloodstream with that catheter, that impregnation, that substance, chlorhexidine, will start eluting. It eludes at a higher rate, if you will, 
on insertion, and then it kind of comes down to a steady state for at least 30 days is what uh, the literature says, not only 30 days, but at least 30 days. Whether you leave those in longer and expect them to work longer is up to you. The manufacturers make no claims on that. Okay. If an antimicrobial catheter is placed in a potentially septic patient and the blood culture does return positive, should that catheter be removed and replaced? Or if the antibiotics are resolving the infection, can it stay in, in place? <laughs> well, that's a pretty good one because uh, actually uh, Dr. Giancarlo uh, Scopatuolo uh, did a study at the Catholic Hospital, he's Mauro Pitarudi's uh, colleague uh, in Rome. And he actually did a study using uh, chlorhexidine silver sulfadiazine uh, impregnated catheters inside and out, the AeroGuard Blue Plus type catheter, uh, and presented that his uh, preliminary results at AVA. Uh, and it did show he was placing these catheters in patients with septicemia on admission. To the, to the hospital, and then when the catheters were removed eventually, he actually uh, did sonication and different cultures with catheter segments, et cetera, and it showed that the catheters not only uh, were not colonized with the organism causing that septicemia, they weren't colonized with anything else either in his study. It was a very small study. It was a preliminary study. Uh, and there have been plans uh, to, to do a similar study with PICS uh, there. Um, and there is a study in Australia going on right now in pediatric patients looking at, can we place a, cat, a can, can we place a central line in a septic patient? Uh, because a lot of times we need that central line to be able to treat the patient. Yes, sir. That answer that. <laughs> Why is it necessary to scrub the hub again if the lion had a protected cap on it? Well, or, gee. Um, greater than five. <laughs> um, so when you remove the cap, you can go ahead and attach. Okay. But are you 100% sure that somebody actually replaced that cap the last time they accessed? or did they just use one that they laid down? Again, we have to look at what's going on in all the different hospitals. So should you swab immediately before you access once you remove the cap? That's not in the recommendations from that from those manufacturers currently I'm, uh, that I'm aware of, but it is in their recommendations in their instructions for use to clean between accesses. So if I'm doing a, a, a saline flush, uh, prior to infusion, I'm going to remove my antiseptic cap. I'm going to attach my pre-filled syringe, flush, remove my syringe, going to clean the needleless connector again, then attach my piggyback or whatever. Then once I remove that, I'm going to clean again, do my flush again, and then I'm going to replace with an antiseptic cap if I'm using those. So it's it is clean before, between, and after in that case. Thank did, you. Did that answer that question? <laughs> I think so. Okay. So um, our friend Laura says, aren't all payments, pay, payment penalties on hold because of COVID right now? And I think we, you were talking earlier about mm -hmm. the cost. Mm -hmm. um, the, you have to realize that the, reduction the reduction for the reduction is two percent occurs before okay before payment for the current year so that's two percent or is held back from the previous year's monies okay the one percent would be actually implemented at the end of that fiscal year so anything they put in already, the 2% they put in has already been taken. Uh, and 
but they're not taking anything in the interim. And I guess there will be decisions made for reduction of payments later on uh, based on this year's data. But again, they're, they run about a year to two years behind in their data that affect this. So yes, right now, if you do have a reduction, you, you are a hospital that's getting that extra 1% reduction routinely based on last year's data. Yes, you may uh, not be having that penalty applied. Thanks, Jim. Um, there are a few questions here about you don't see the handouts or you're not able to see what you're after. So in the handout section, um, there are a couple things that say video PDF. Um, TFX technology with video. That's the name of the slide deck. So it's not truly a video, it's a PDF of the slide deck. So go ahead and grab that. If you cannot get it, just email Ava ED for Ava Education at avainfo.org and we'll get that to you. But they are there. Um, the other question was how do we get my CE? You can either go and get the QR code, take a picture of it, it'll take you right to the survey, or we'll, after um, we finish the presentation, an automatic email goes out to you with the link for that evaluation. Okay. So um have you got have you had recent experience with the use of midline catheters in covid patients uh i don't insert catheters currently today so that would be a good question for uh somebody on our vascular access team um and there are a couple of groups uh there's face uh two face groups that I'm aware of uh, that are concerned with vascular access. There's a lot of information sharing there, um, as well as uh, a Twitter group. So, um, Judy, I think you may have the we, name we've had people, um, We had our coffee talk um, asked the experts on Saturday. Yeah. It was discussed as well. And, okay. you know, it's, it's really patient dependent. And some of the answers, and I'm not placing lines right now, so I'm going to try to paraphrase what some of our experts were talking about, but because you don't want to go in there and actually assess the patient as frequently, mm -hmm. and that is a higher level of assessment, quite possibly, because we're not going to infiltrate with a CVAD as easily. So there's discussion. It's back and forth. And it's the clinical picture of that patient. That patient could be on multiple drips that are inappropriate for peripheral access. So I think um, we have to make those clinical decisions, which is difficult, difficult for sure. Sorry, I didn't give you a full answer, but I wouldn't do it. That's my full answer. So that might be one of the things you want to post on the Facebook groups for vascular access. And I think there's a link to those on APA website, if I'm not mistaken. I, I'm not sure about that, but not easy to find. Sure, but it's easy to find. <laughs> Just search vascular access. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, is there any concerns with antimicrobial substances alluding into the vessel of the patient, i.e. contraindications of CHG or um, sulfur reactions? Um, sulfur reactions, uh, Patients that uh, the actual incidence of sulfa allergy is minimal today, uh, based on the fact that we don't use that many sulfa drugs anymore. Um, so the patients aren't becoming sensitized to it, even though if, if a patient is on a sulfa drug uh, or actually has a sulfa sens sulfur sensitivity, we need to. Uh, consider using an alternative catheter. Uh, same thing with minocycline rifampin or chlorhexidine. If they have sens known sensitivity uh, or suspected sensitivity to either of those antibiotics or to the chlorhexidine uh, as an antiseptic, uh, then we should consider an alternative catheter um, okay. for those patients. Can you tell us about the efficacy of the antimicrobial and antithromogenic catheters when the pH is out of our pretty zone? So above seven, below five? I'm sorry, would you repeat that? I'm... Efficacy of the catheter, um, antimicrobial, antithromogenic, when the pH is askew, high or low? Um, Does it change as, it? as 
when we're talking about pH of the blood, uh, that catheters. Talking about pH of the infusate, not the. the yeah, um, they're tested with multiple infusates. Uh, there's routine protocols in the design and development of catheters, and the FDA does require some testing with certain substances uh, to see if there's any degradation or exolution or anything like that, as well as you know for anything on the outside in the pH of blood. So um, these catheters would probably not be cleared to market if there was something uh, major with, with different effects of pH. Thank you. So this question has to do with um, incident of DVT or thr catheter-related thrombosis mm -hmm. based on insertion site, be it IJ versus axillary versus other insertion sites. Um, it's quite interesting. There's not a lot uh, in the literature that specifies specific insertion sites. Uh, there's a few articles that do, uh, but then again, they, there's nothing to compare it to. It, it's their institution's particular experience. So that wasn't included in the meta-analyses that I did review uh, or that we reviewed in building this. Um, we do see similar, uh, if not almost mirroring incidences of catheter-related thrombosis with short-term acute CVCs as we see with uh, hips. So in the in the newer literature. That's okay. the only thing I can have to answer to that one. This is related to blood culture results. Uh -huh. Does the antimicrobial technology alter results? Yes, it will. Um, and if you read uh, if you read about the whatever type of catheter you're using, whether it's antibiotic or anti uh, or the antimicrobial with solar cell diazine or and or chlorhexidine, um, we need to use a neutralizing um, a neutralizing solution in our cultures in our auger plates, if you will. Uh, oh, you're talking about rolling rolling the catheter, right, Jim? Uh, yeah, I think. I think this was about blood cultures themselves. Oh, blood cultures. Yeah, I, I believe it shouldn't so. affect the blood culture itself. No, I was okay. talking about catheter cultures. Yeah, but the other way, I think that's a great explanation mm -hmm. on the other as well. Yeah, it's not a it's not enough elution to uh, cause an effect uh, to that blood culture result. Thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, change direction a little bit. What is the incidence of anaphylaxis in patients with catheters that are impregnated or coded or covered? Uh, yeah, extremely low. Um, there was one uh, meta-analysis done in Australia. Australia has specific guidelines on the use of chlorhexidine in general, including chlorhexidine uh, type catheters. And what they looked at was they looked at all reports in the literature, uh, and you were talking, and you're talking about 24 thousandths of a percent. Uh, yes, it does occur. Uh, and in one of the studies that I looked at in, in Japan, they had three in one hospital. Uh, and a little over a year period, uh, but we don't really see that kind of, of reporting. So somewhat, it, it's somewhat not really known, but it's minimal uh, experience with those types of, of allergic reactions, if you will. Thank you. Are these the antimicrobial antithrombogenic catheters only made by Teleflex, and are they available in non-tunneled and PIC it says pick catheters, but I'm just um, so your antithrombogenic slash antimicrobial is only available currently as a midline or a pick, um, the chlorhexidine ones. Um, you don't have it. You the you don't have any other combination catheters, if you will. You have the antithrombogenic. Isn't, huh? isn't Jack also that line? Yes, I'm sorry. Well, it's a central one. Yeah. There is a central one. Yeah. 
it's a central line. So, okay. so yeah. So, uh, but you, you, they do have antimicrobial you know, midlines and short-term acute central lines as well, and dialysis catheters. Uh, but right now there's only a pick or a midline and then Jack, which is a central line, sorry. <laughs> it's a small central line uh, that is the uh, chlorhexidine technology that's both anti-thrombogenic and antimicrobial. Thank you, thank you. So we've got a couple about heparin, um, heparin flushing um, recommendations. Um, gosh, you know, those are, those, that's a hard one. Um, manufacturers uh, typically don't include those types of recommendations in their instructions for use any longer. Uh, they used to put them in more often, but now most instructions for use say, uh, refer to your hospital policies and procedures and or uh, current standards and guidelines for practice. So um, I, I believe in the guidelines for practice in the hospital, uh, it's an either or situation with central venous catheters. Outpatient, it's an either or situation with central catheters. Uh, there's no hard and fast recommendation. Uh, normal saline is definitely recommended for flushing your short peripherals that are locked, but I haven't seen anything that gives a firm yes or no on heparin locks for uh, other catheters. As far as a heparin flush, nobody flushes with heparin. Uh, you either lock the catheter with heparin, then flush it through when you reaccess. But nobody has, that I'm aware of has a hard and fast rule in standards or guidelines. Do you, Judy? Are you aware of them? Um, I think the world has basically kind of moved away from heparin because of yeah, they have. It's and things just, of that sort. But right now, because of yeah. because of COVID and the the coagulable states, people are moving a little bit closer to yeah. it at times. So. Uh, I, we can't really give you a guideline on that right now. It's a real hard one. Yeah, it's a hard one yeah. because there's no right or wrong. Recommendations. We're um, kind of moving track a little bit into pediatrics. So are there recommendations uh -huh. as far as protected lines for peds? Yeah, protected lines are used uh, in infants uh, all the way up to us old people. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, uh, the smallest uh, protected catheter that I'm aware of is uh, there's a five French triple lumen CVC uh, that's available for, you yeah, know, that's five centimeters long for little tiny, tiny kids. Uh, but, uh, and then there are uh, three, four and five French uh, CVCs also that are protected. Thanks. So Jim Bryant, our friend from Virginia, had a very inter uh, interesting IJ CBC insertion yesterday. Transverse uh -oh. view of the IJ and carotid revealed large what appeared to be second IJ. It was compressible. Uh, look, it says compressible, compressible, <laughs> not pulsatile, and like a hundred percent venous. After the stick, aspirated yellowish clear fluid, looked like limb. What uh -huh. do you think it could be? It could have been a lymph channel because under yeah, ultrasound, uh, under, uh, yeah, under ultrasound, uh, with ultrasound, fluid is dark like a black. Okay, uh, it's not, it's not a coic, if you will. So, um, and if you looked at a lymph channel or something like that, or you would see the outside, uh, you'd have to look really close and know what you're looking at because. With ultrasound, you can actually see the layers of the vessel if you look really, really, really close, uh, which maybe which should be absent in the other, but uh, it could just mimic uh, the look of a vein. And yeah, uh, those those lymph channels actually do uh, occur in all those different parts of the body, particularly near the IJ. Yeah, um, were there any so valves? I would assume it's that. Uh, the only way I'd, you'd know is if you ran a chemistry. Yeah, true, true, true. 
So we're going to take just a couple more, and then after the fact, because we've run it in about two hours now, and I appreciate each of you that have stayed on this long, but um, I think we'll take one more, actually, and then the rest of the questions we have, I'll wrap them all up in a bow and send them to you, Jim. How's that sound? Okay. Thanks. Okay, so let's go for... Early, Jim, earlier you stated that antimicrobial catheters were only considered if they had silver sulfadiazine or they were impregnated with antibiotics. You just said, said that blue protection was CHP, but it's listed under antimicrobial technologies. Can you clarify? <laughs> you, well, antimicrobial technologies can be either antiseptic or antibiotic. That's currently what's available. So chlorhexidine is an antiseptic. Uh, silver sulfadiazine is an antiseptic, um, where minocycline and ricanthin are antibiotics. They're a classification of antimicrobial catheters, yes. So I want to thank everybody. Jim, thank you so much for your expertise. And Teleflex, thank you so much for sponsoring this event. It was wonderful. And you guys be safe out there. Can't wait to see you at our next one.